I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Middletown Township Board of Supervisors. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Corbel, would you please call roll? Mr. Kizak. Here. Ms. Payne? Here. Ms. Kane? Here. We also have in attendance tonight Ms. Tealy Cools, Township Manager, Township Solicitor Mr. Esposito, and Township Engineer Mr. Kessler. Thank you, Ms. Corporal. A few announcements and special items. First, the next Board of Supervisors meeting will be Monday, May 16th at 7 p.m. Second, uh, this month is Cystic Fibrosis Month, and we have a proclamation, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Supervisor Payne. Thank you. Whereas cystic fibrosis, commonly referred to as CF, is a genetic disease affecting over 70,000 children and adults worldwide, 30,000 in the United States, and 1,490 in Pennsylvania, and whereas a defective gene causes the body to produce an abnormally thick, sticky mucus that clogs the lungs, these secretions produce a life-threatening lung infections and obstruct the pancreas, preventing digestive enzymes from reaching the intestines to help break down and absorb food. And whereas more than 10 million Americans are symptomless carriers of the defective CF gene, the median predicted age of survival for a person with cystic fibrosis born in 2019 is 48.4 years old. With advanced treatment in CF, the number of CF adults has steadily grown, and approximately 1,000 new cases of CF are diagnosed each year. Over 50% of the CF population is 18 years old and people with CF have a variety of symptoms attributed to the more than 2,000 mutations of the CF gene. And whereas infant blood screenings detect genetic defects is the most reliable and least costly method to identify persons likely to have cystic fibrosis, early diagnosis of cystic fibrosis permits early treatment and enhanced quality of life, and longevity and treatment for CF depends on the stage of the disease and the organs involved. Now, therefore, be it further proclaimed that the month of May is hereby designated as Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month. Improving the length and quality of life for people with CF starts with awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Uh, in addition, this is also Air Quality Awareness Week. National Air Quality Awareness Week is May 2nd through 8th, 2022. It marks the beginning of ozone season when the greater Philadelphia region typically begins to experience poor air quality from high levels of ground level ozone. National Air Quality Awareness Week kicks off efforts to reduce summertime air pollution. To help uh, Transportation Management uh, Association of Bucks County and the DR, uh, DVRPC raise awareness of Bucks County's air quality problem, check out the daily air quality forecast and sign up for alerts at www.air qualitypartnership.org. We have some upcoming events. Um, first of all, Wolf of Palooza is going to be Sunday, May 8th. Registration begins at 7.30 a.m. and this is being held at Forsythia Crossing Park. Second, the Community Conversations with the Middletown Human Relations Commission is holding Understanding and Appreciating the Native American Experience. And that will be Monday, May 9th at 7 p.m. in the Public Hall. Third, the 10th Annual Sports Block Party has been scheduled for Friday, May 13th. JV games start at 4.30 at the Middletown Community Park. And finally, our Parkland Fire Company is holding its 100th anniversary event, and this is going to be Saturday, May 14th. They're holding a raffle, and we have raffle tickets available. Uh, Paul Capera, our Director of Park and Recreation, has them for sale in the back. So please think about uh, purchasing a raffle ticket, help out Parkland Fire Company as they celebrate their 100th anniversary. My understanding is that they have some great prizes that are being raffled off. And with that, we will move on to public comment on non-agenda items. This is public comment on non-agenda items only. Is there any public comment? Yes, ma'am. Please come up and state your name and address. Thank you. Hi, Kathleen Horwat, 1229 West Maple Avenue. I own. My grandchildren all live there, and they also live at 1237 West Maple Avenue. Most of you know me throughout the audience. As another municipality, I have attempted to speak with you since the beginning of February. That attempt was stopped until recently. I am speaking to you strictly as a resident and a taxpayer of 1229 West Maple Avenue. 
Unfortunately, many, many people in the whole Middletown Township, Greater Langhorne area are unaware of what is going on with the PennDOT US-1 RC3 plan for 413. That is not your fault, that is not my fault, it's not PennDOT's fault, it's the fact of today's world. We know everything that's going on in the world. We know very little about what is happening locally because of the lack of jur local journalism. So what we do know is coming out bits and pieces and very, very late to all of us. The fact is we do support all, I think almost everybody here, and I am a member of 80% of all the organizations that are represented in the Middletown Township and Langhorne area. We do support US-1 improvements. We do support safety improvements. We do support the fact that the municipalities should never have been charged with the responsibility of the access roads. We are most concerned now that there will be one exit at 413 in addition to come off of US-1. I am at the playground every day at 413 and 213 with our eight-year-old. You cannot get through that gridlock and once all the side streets are closed off, which almost hardly anybody knows is going to happen, there will be no getting to West Middletown, where my grandchildren live, to Neshaminy High School, to all of those areas, unless we get off down at Neshaminy High School. This is going to be a major gridlock. Once you get into 413, 213, there is no left turn. They will not allow a left turn. I was involved with getting all the new traffic signals. They won't allow a left turn there. There's not enough room. So then all the traffic's gonna come off at Flower Mills and 213, and you're gonna have major gridlock all around here. We, all I am asking is that you come back. We have all been talked to separately. I'm asking that we all be talked to together and we work cooperatively to come up with some additional solutions in addition to all the safety features so that all our residents can do what we want to do, get home to our families, get home to our activities, and do everything we possibly can to make this a better community. On my wall, and I put on the bur our walls in our government, is Middletown Township map. This is a historic map. Just for a keynote, you can buy it at Historic Langhorn and have it framed, but it's showing you we are all one community and we all need to work together to resolve this major problem, which right now is gridlock, but it's definitely going to be gridlock when all the people find out that all the access to West Middletown, to Feasterville, to North Middletown, all of that is going to be shut down with people trying to make a left or right turn at 213. So we need your help. That's all we're asking. Please, you know, and I'm gonna go buy my tickets now. And thank you for listening. Kathleen Horwat, 1229 West Babel. Uh, thank you for being here. And um, just to, Reiterate, I think, the sentiment that we as a board expressed at the last public meeting uh, when we heard comments from a lot of um, representatives from your community as well as our own. Um, the board expressed certainly broad support for the improvements to Route 1 as we believe that it is a, um, a safety concern for residents of this township. But we also certainly expressed uh, a value for the relationship that we have with the members of your community and a willingness to continue to discuss ideas, options, and to keep that dialogue going. So certainly welcome that opportunity and, and we look forward to doing that in the future, so thank you. Just for the record, I'm not from my other community. I'm 1229 West Maple. Fair enough. <laughs> Are there any other public comments on non-agenda items? Yes, sir, just please state your name and address. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Bladen, former mayor of Langhorn Borough. Um, we're all involved in this, as we know. I have three concerns that I want to address. 
I know they've been brought up a few times, but they bear repetition. The three concerns are the roundabout, the extension of the four lanes into Langhorne Borough from the um, new circle, traffic circle, the new convolution, and pedestrian access, which is more germane to you. It's my belief that the construction of the roundabout after the egress from Route 1 heading south, which will be closed off onto Bellevue Avenue heading south, and it was, it was terminated, I think there is actually uh, no need for the roundabout. There'll be no traffic coming down Bellevue, very little coming from West Highland, and functionally it'll just be a big left turn or right turn for the main traffic and probably a red flashing light for the two smaller roads coming in and two yellow flashing lights for the main turning would probably be the best idea there. I know it's in the manor and not your purview. Uh, extending the four lane highway a thousand feet down to Flowers Avenue is in my judgment a great waste of money. It'll destroy a lot of trees, it'll take away people's property, and it'll create traffic hazard in our borough. The big question hanging up there is does PennDOT have ideas of extending it all the way to Newtown? If they do, I think that's folly because they have two railroad tunnels they'll have to deal with. And to surmount that project will cause a great deal more cost than the intersection there thinking of doing. The third one and the biggest one and more to you, your concern is the pedestrian access across Route 1. Looking at the maps and so on, I still can't figure out what they have designed. But without a sidewalk going up from Bellevue Avenue up the hill to Pine Street and a dedicated separated sidewalk going across Route 1, to the clover leaf, it's nothing but a very dangerous pedestrian hazard, unacceptable. The better alternative would be a pedestrian bridge across Route 1, either at Hill Avenue or Station Avenue. The bridge at Humeville Avenue, Humeville Road, further to the west, out of the, is out of the borough. There are no sidewalk access from either the manor or from Langhorne and it's extremely dangerous to try to use that. Now I'm aware that the manor is not in favor of it, at least what I've heard, but I don't think they're thinking of the future and I don't think that they realize that it's the one thing that will connect both halves of their borough. I just want to raise your conscious level on those two things and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am, please state your name and address. I'm Nancy, my name is Nancy Culleton. I live at 207 West Richardson Avenue in Langhorne Borough. Um, I am a member of Langhorne Borough Council, but I'm uh, coming today to speak uh, not in that role, but as a, a citizen of Langhorne Borough who has similar concerns about the um, Cloverleaf project uh, that is part of the RC3 PennDOT um, plan. And like most of my neighbors, um, I s totally support the safety, uh, the, the plans for safety improvements along Route 1. Um, I've, I, I don't know of anybody uh, that I've spoken to who is opposed to, to those. Um, and I have never um, f felt in such unity with my neighbors uh, in opposing the cloverleaf portion of that project for uh, most of the same reasons that have already been stated. I agree with uh, Kathy, Kathy Horwat, who spoke um, a couple of minutes ago. Um, and uh, last summer, uh, Langhorne Borough Council did uh, pass a resolution in opposition to the cloverleaf part of that plan, not any opposition to the safety improvements on Route 1. Um, my concern, of course, is for safety and um, uh, all the safety concerns that have been mentioned and also uh, the concern about further congestion along uh, Pine Street and Maple Avenue. And it seems to me that, as we know, what's, what 
happens in Langhorne Borough doesn't stay in Langhorne Borough and will spill over to Middletown Township. Um, and uh, in terms of backups, in terms of congestion, the things that have already been mentioned. And to me, um, those results seem inconsistent with what I understand of what I've seen of your climate action plan. I know that Middletown has, plan, um, has goals to reduce um, not only its carbon footprint, but also to um, uh, achieve greater connectivity, parts of the township, um, uh, encourage, p encouraging people to use public transportation, making it easier to get around by bike, public transportation, and foot. And I think that this, uh, the results of the cl uh, Cloverleaf would absolutely uh, impede that process. So m my final point is just that I'm really grateful that Middletown is taking this issue under con careful consideration. Um, and um, uh, and hope that you will continue to uh, to kind of take a, a, a careful approach to review all the evidence uh, as you prepare to uh, communicate with PennDOT. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Yes, sir. Please state your name and address at the microphone. I'm Paul Shanahan. I live at the 413 exit in Middletown right of Route 1 North, that's, that's where Pellevue Avenue intersects Route 1 North and South actually on the other side. Uh, is there going to be an open contact with PennDOT to find out exactly what they're planning? And Because I haven't been contacted by anyone and I live right at the exit. So yeah, I mean, we have been in contact with PennDOT, as I think the other municipalities have. Our understanding has consistently been that PennDOT will be holding some sort of a public meeting where they'll display their plans and allow the public to come and view them and ask questions and provide feedback. Last we heard, that was going to be taking place this month, although I don't know, do we have a date? Uh, latest is July. So now it's July. But the answer to your question is yes, there is, PennDOT is planning to do that, although I can't speak directly for PennDOT. Yeah, I haven't been contacted by the township or PennDOT or, you know, anybody except the borough who is interested mainly in just the borough. So, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a township project, it's PennDOT's project. So they contact us just as they've contacted the borough. Um, Certainly we can share information with you and you can provide, if you want, your contact information to the township manager. We'll be glad to you know, communicate anything to you that we hear. Keep me up to date. Okay, sure, certainly. that'd be good. Thank you. And, and we can advocate on your behalf to PennDOT. We, we have just heard from one resident mm -hmm. and you know I'm connecting that person with PennDOT. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I'll add too that uh, for these big highway projects that PennDOT does, they do set up websites to keep the latest information on there. They do have one for this project. It's us1bucks.com. Uh, so that's a resource as well, uh, as far as seeing the latest that PennDOT posts uh, about their plans and also, I would thank any kind of public meetings. Thank you, Mr. Kessler. Any other public comment? Yes, ma'am. State your name and address, please. Francis Grouse, 360 Greenridge Drive in uh, Langhorne. Uh, I just have a question. I wanted to go on record as saying that I agree with the three people have, who have spoken previously. And do you need the names of everyone here in the audience who agrees with them in order to, you know, have a forum or whatever it, it takes? You know, I don't want it to appear that just three people here in the audience are in objection when there are a great number of us here who really are not going to get up and labor it because we have the same concerns as the three who have spoken. Do you want our names to go on record, or how does that work? Uh, I appreciate the fact that you're not going to have everybody come up here and repeat the same sentiments over and over again. And certainly, it's acknowledged by the board that the room is full of, of individuals. What I would suggest um, is, if you're interested in making sure we have your names, send us an email, um, okay. and then we'll have it. And then we at least it'll or be. Or can we do a show of hands, and they can put down? There were ten people. I, in the I'm audience. not going to. I'm not going to call a vote on the audience as to who's in favor and who's opposed. I don't think that's appropriate. This okay. Is, this is public comment. But if you anybody. Is is free to reach out to us via email and offer their support, their questions, their opinions on a particular topic. Um, in addition, of course, this is still open public comments. So if anybody does want to speak, they're welcome to. Thank you. Thank you. Email. 
Yeah, if you just, the township manager can provide that information to you. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. Good evening, thank you. I'm Paul Schneider, 233 North Bellevue Avenue, Langhorne Borough. I just wanna start out by saying I'm not as young as I used to be. Um, 22 years ago, my wife and I bought a house in, uh, for our mother-in-law, or my mother-in-law, um, over here on Black Eyed Susan Road. Uh, with the long-term goal of moving in there, that goal seems to be moving closer and closer, but my mother-in-law still lives there and she's not as young as she used to be either. Um, our hope though, my hope, um, when I do, when we do move there, is that Langhorne Borough will remain the vibrant part of the community that it has been throughout our 35 years in the borough, and that it will be easy for us to get to the borough to enjoy the events that are going on there. Neither of those things is likely if PennDOT is, is able to run a four-lane highway into town. Um, it's, we, we agree, I'm, you may have heard this once or twice this evening, but we agree with the safety uh, portions of the Route 1 plan, et cetera. But the expansion of 413 is just, it, it's just going to create gridlock that's going to spill beyond Langhorne Borough. It's going to spill into Middletown. Uh, we, we saw that a few weeks ago um, during the incident on Route 1. Um, it's, it's only going to be trouble. It's only going to ruin our quality of life, whether we live in Langhorne or whether we live in Middletown Township. We need, I, I appreciate your willingness to work together. I know a few weeks ago you were talking about the need that this is early days and you talked about the need for residents to communicate um, their concerns to PennDOT uh, and, and I think through you to PennDOT. So we need you to be receptive of that to the, the greater impact on the community. Um, you know, personally, it seems to me to make a lot of sense to re-sign 413 to I-295 and, and 332 the bypass, both of which already are built for the kind of traffic that's being proposed for the borough. That's the kind of thing, and by the way, that might save a, a few million dollars if that's important to PennDOT. So in any event, thank you for listening. I do appreciate your, your, your time to listen to all of the people who are coming here. Um, we need to continue this dialogue rather than uh, accepting what PennDOT gives us. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment, non-agenda items. Yes, ma'am, in the back. to bring the microphone down. Sorry. Uh, my name is Deborah Till. I live at 197 West Marshall Avenue in Langhorne. Our home is in Middletown Township. We live on the back nine of the uh, Langhorne Country Club, so we are officially a Middletown resident, although when I step off of my driveway, I step into Langhorne Borough. So we're, we kind of live in both worlds. Uh, I urge you to really carefully consider the impact that this PennDOT project is going to have on the Langhorne community. Our road right now, West Marshall Avenue, has really become a cut through. There's been a lot more traffic over the last few years. This project is going to create even more traffic. People cut through down Green Street, off of 213, down West Maple Avenue, I mean, down West Marshall Avenue. And we're now starting to call it the new Langhorne Speedway because it really is getting to be a problem. It's a walking community. There are very few sidewalks on our street. And I just really urge you to take a look at how it's going to affect our little borough. And even though I live in Middletown, I consider it my borough as well. 
So I appreciate you listening to me, and I hope that you will take this into serious consideration. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any other public comment on non-agenda items? Yes, ma'am. Come up to the microphone, state your name and address. Hello, uh, my name's Jean White, and I live at uh, 149 West Richardson Avenue in Langhorne Borough. And um, I actually was born in Langhorne, and um, you know, grew up there until I was in my 20s or whatever. But um, already when I came back in early 2000s to live there, and I actually lived in between there uh, for a while too in Langhorne, I was kind of blown away with how there wasn't walking area. You know, already the town had been split, but I really feel now with this project that it will be really split in half and the traffic will be like make it really hard for like the uh, playground for the kids to, for anyone to even cross the street there. There's historical things that like the uh, AME church where, um, you know, the, the traffic is gonna come to a, a bottleneck there. Um, I'm just really concerned that it's gonna ruin a lot of what Langhorne already is, you know? And I'm hoping that um, there's gonna be another choice. I love the idea of, you know, uh, traffic going a, in a different route and not coming through Langhorne, because I don't know how that is gonna be positive for the town itself, for uh, any areas that are around there. It's just gonna be, um, really a lot and it's not gonna make it more, like I look at Langhorne and I think I want it to be more walker friendly, maybe bike friendly, kid friendly. Um, my grandchildren live far away, but um, you know, I would just really like to see it be more of, uh, you know, of the town that it, it still is, but that this project is gonna really make it into something different, just a through fare, you know, with some areas on the edge that are still uh, historic. And um, anyway, I'm hoping that you folks feel the same way and you would like to see, you know, things, uh, the PennDOT project take an another route. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. We've had, um, I guess this will be the third public meeting where we've taken comments on this particular project and we certainly did ask for feedback from the public and we've gotten it. So thank you to everybody who came out to express uh, their opinions on uh, the Route 1 RST3 project. Um, is there any other public comment on non-agenda items before we move on? Yes, sir. Um, I'm Joseph Bredo from 452 South Bellevue Avenue. Um, I just wanted to take a point and uh, reflect on what everybody has said here. Um, everybody's coming together as a community and we don't wanna see this project follow through the entire way like PennDOT has said. So like what I would say is for us as a community to go and email everybody or get your friends and start you know, sending things over to PennDOT and for the board to really acknowledge what's going on and how the community wants it to really go through with this project. I don't think, uh, we own a, a business right on uh, Bellevue Ave, uh, Paterno's gas station, I don't know if you heard of it. Um, and that's just gonna completely destroy our business and a lot of businesses inside of the Langhorn Bureau. So um, I think that it would be better for us to implement the safety rules but not follow through with the four-way highway plan. Um, and that's just personally my opinion. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Lisa Littlefield, 501 Corporate Drive, Langhorn. Uh, I'm a realtor. I just wanna say on behalf of all the people who live in the residential subdivisions, if this plan goes through, uh, get ready to expect your appraisal value to completely crash. Um, I think it's an outrage, the plan, a total outrage. 
uh, particularly with the uh, runways, like a uh, airport runway coming down the uh, Cloverleaf on the Gillum Avenue. Um, strongly in favor of an alternate plan, but I'm here on behalf of the residents is living in R1, residential subdivisions. Your appraisal's going to tank if you let the plan go through as it stands. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other public comment, I'll move on to the next agenda item, which will be the consent agenda items. Item A, consideration of authorizing payment of the May 2nd, 2022 bills list in the amount of $351,065.74. And item B, consideration of approving the April 18th, 2022 minutes of the public meeting of the Middletown Township Board of Supervisors. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve all consent agenda items as, uh, as stated. Thank you, Ms. Corporal. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been a motion and a second. Are there any board questions? Any questions from the public? Question. God bless you. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 0. Next on the agenda, consideration of the McHale's Kitchen and Bath Preliminary and Final Land Development Plan 2462 Trenton Road, Levittown, Pennsylvania, 19056, TMP 22-051-195 and 22-051-195.001 S slash LD number 2201. Yes, gentlemen. Good evening. Mike McGinnis from Begley Carlin here on behalf of McHale's. I uh, have with me Heath Dumack to my left and also members of the McHale's family are in the audience as well if there's any questions regarding their operation. The subject property at issue is 2462 Trenton Road. It's comprised of two tax parcel numbers, 22-51195 and 22-51195-001. The subject parcels are zoned professional and uh, very briefly, the plan here is to consolidate the two parcels and construct a 4,800 square foot office building. Uh, that office building is depicted on the plan, which is in front of the board. Well, now, now we're scrolling to the site plan. Um, it is going to just be utilized for McHale's employees. So this is a one and a half story administrative office building. Uh, we are not adding or proposing to add any impervious surface with this application. In fact, there's a reduction of impervious surface because this is currently being built on impervious surface from approximately 52% to approximately 43%. What we're attempting to do um, really in the era of COVID is to uh, expand the operations into this small office building for administrative staff and to consolidate the administrative staff and employees into this office building. There will be no deliveries of equipment or product with this building. Uh, we are not adding any employees with this operation. Uh, and I would like to basically state and cover as a housekeeping item at the outset, there was some back and forth at the Planning Commission regarding some of the waiver requests. And we are uh, withdrawing the waiver requests that were stated that we were seeking and which Mr. Dumack's office supplied in his waiver request letter with respect to sidewalk installation and offsite curbing. Uh, so we can get into the specific areas in those waiver requests which are being withdrawn in Mr. Dumack's letter, but I did want to state that at the outset. The rest of the waiver requests uh, which we're seeking this evening really pertain to the fairly limited scope of this project. Uh, one of the other items that came up at the Planning Commission meeting that I wanted to state for clarity was there was some discussion regarding the potential to drag any of the existing stone or gravel in the parking lot out onto Trenton Road. Um, that is not occurring presently and will not be occurring with this project. We are paving at the entrance for ingress and egress. So we're really just asking the board's indulgence to allow the existing condition to remain with respect to the rest of the parking layout. And I think you'll see with the waiver requests again, most of our uh, waiver requests like things from existing features are just asking again for the board's consideration because at the end of the day, this is just a uh, 4,800 square foot building being constructed onto additional uh, current impervious surface. Uh, so with that, uh, certainly if you would like to go through any of the plan, Mr. Dumack is here and he can discuss the layout. I'm also happy to go through the waiver requests and their justification or I can provide to the board an explanation as to the waivers that we are uh, formally withdrawing if that would be simpler. 
Can you just remind me the two that are being withdrawn? Yes, well, actually there's a couple. So substantively they pertain to curbing his sidewalks, but there are actually multiple waiver requests which are being withdrawn in Mr. Dumack's April 6th, 2022 letter if the board has a copy of that. So the first waiver that is listed, I'm going through chronologically um, in this review letter and the waiver request that's being withdrawn is from section 440-419-D which is uh, to not require sidewalk installation along the property frontage that is being withdrawn. Uh, a waiver request from 440-420 with respect to the installation of curbing along the frontage that is being withdrawn. There is a waiver request from 440-509A uh, to not require sidewalks along existing streets that is being withdrawn. There is a uh, waiver from 440-510A to not require curbing along existing streets that is also being withdrawn. And then from 440-510B, which is to not require street widening and curbs along existing streets, that would really be a partial waiver at this point because we're still asking for the um, permission to not expand and widen the street, but the curbing aspect of that is being withdrawn, so that would be classified as a partial waiver. The rest of the waivers uh, pertaining to existing features, uh, preliminary and final in tandem, and I can go through these um, if it would be the board's pleasure, those remain. All right, I think, I think we have them all. Great. Any questions or comments from the board uh, for Mr. McGinnis or for uh, Mr. Dumag? Yeah, so my understanding is you're re re withdrawing those because you will be putting the sidewalks in or uh, doing in lieu of? That's okay. correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Or if not, I can accept a motion. I'll make a motion to grant preliminary final land development approval for McHale's Kitchen and Bath, 2462 Trenton Road, SLD number 22-01 with the following conditions. One, applicant shall comply in full with all requirements of the Middletown Township subdivision and land development ordinance and the Middletown Township zoning ordinance unless relief was granted by the body having jurisdiction. Two, all comments still outstanding in review letters shall be fully addressed for plans to be considered final. I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Corporal. Thank you, Ms. Payne. There's been a motion and a second. Are there any board questions at this time? Are there any questions from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4 1. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Next on the agenda is consideration of the Popeyes Restaurant Preliminary Final Land Development Plan, 1791 East Lincoln Highway, Leventown, PA, 19056, TMP 22-047-198-003, slash LD, number 21-09. Mr. McGinnis again. All right. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mike McGinnis again here tonight on behalf of Pozell and Popeyes. Uh, the subject parcel for this project is 1791 East Lincoln Highway. Uh, this is the site of the uh, former Rosemary's Grill in the township. The proposal is to build a Popeyes restaurant at the lo existing location. Uh, it's going to be approximately 2,145 square feet. Uh, that's a little bit less than half the size of the existing restaurant on site. Uh, the property is 1.4 acres and it's zoned commercial. Uh, we went to the zoning hearing board in September and received a special exception relating to the drive-through use somewhere at the planning commission last month. Um, there are a number of pre-existing non-conforming conditions from a dimensional standpoint which we are approving, improving, excuse me, with this application. Uh, for example, our impervious surface and building coverages have gone down considerably. We're adding green space and a number of our dimensional setbacks are now being brought into conformance or being improved. Uh, again, we think this is a good location for the restaurant in the township. This is consistent with the surrounding area and the surrounding businesses. We have received uh, clean review letters from both uh, Remington and Vernick and TPD. Uh, we have secured our MPDS permitting and everything in the review letters that are outstanding are will comply items with the exception of uh, really two and a half waivers 
Uh, we, and I'll detail the one waiver in a second, uh, we're requesting a waiver, again, from preliminary final at once. We are requesting a waiver with respect to sidewalk installation along Lincoln Highway. Um, this was uh, required some back and forth in March because of the unique site logistics here with the grading on Lincoln Highway. So we looked to be able to install sidewalks along Lincoln Highway, uh, and that was not feasible. And I think Mr. Worst is here and can confirm. Uh, Mr. Riggle and Mr. Worst had a number back and forth to try to facilitate that. Uh, so what we ended up doing was we're requesting a partial waiver because there are sidewalks that are being installed to the, what I'm gonna call the interior of the site, but not the exterior along Lincoln Highway. Uh, and then the final waiver that we're asking for is from 440-421E8, and that's regarding parking area curb lines having a five foot radius. Um, that's a, a radius that we're requesting to be three feet. Uh, otherwise, again, I think everything is, is clean. Uh, Mr. Riggle is here with me from Collier's. We have Jerry Murphy from Popeyes, if there's any Popeyes related questions. And we have um, a couple members from Pozell if there's any landlord based questions. But uh, everything else here is uh, fairly straightforward. We look forward to bringing Popeyes to this location. And uh, we look forward to facilitating some of the site improvements and reductions of things like impervious surface with this development. And that's the colored rendering for the site. So if there are any questions or if it would be helpful, uh, Chris could walk through the, uh, the site layout, but you can see the added green space with this site, the reduction of the footprint of the building, um, and perhaps even some of the grading concerns to the frontage with respect to Lincoln Highway. So the three waivers are combined, preliminary and final, the partial sidewalk Correct. along Lincoln Highway, and then um, the curb radius to be less than five feet. That, that is correct. Okay. Any questions from, uh, or comments from the board? If not, I can accept a motion. I'll make a motion to grant preliminary and final land development approval for the Popeye's restaurant, 1791 East Lincoln Highway, S slash LD 21-09 with the following conditions. Applicant shall comply in full with all requirements of Middletown Township Subdivision and Land Development Ordinance and the Middletown Township Zoning Ordinance unless relief was granted by the body having jurisdiction. Two, all comments still outstanding in review letters shall be fully addressed for plans to be considered final. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Is there a second? Second. It's been a motion and a second. Any board questions at this time? Any questions from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4-0. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Next on the agenda, consideration of authorizing the preparation and advertisement of an ordinance memorializing the no parking zone on Golf Club Drive. Ah, Township Manager Tioli Cools. Uh, as you all know, Windy Bush is a development off of Maple Avenue. Um, it is a one-way loop, so there's a two-way entrance with a one-way loop. The board has previously restricted parking on the two-way portion. Um, for as long as the development has been in place, there has been no parking on the left-hand side of the loop as you travel around the uh, one-way loop. Um, we identified recently um, through the Citizens Traffic Commission efforts that there is in fact not an ordinance backing up that no parking. And so this is really just a housekeeping item to request authorization of the drafting and advertising of an ordinance to allow uh, for this no parking to remain. There's no cost with the exception of the advertisement costs um, for the ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Tioli Cools. Any questions uh, for Ms. Tioli Cools from the board? Seeing none, I'll move to authorize the township solicitor to draft and advertise an ordinance amending chapter 470 of the Middletown Township Co Code of Ordinances to designate uh, left side of the entirety of the one-way portion of Golf Club Drive as a no parking zone. Is there a second? A second. Ms. Corporal, you got it in first. It's been a motion and a second. Are there any board questions? Any questions from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
passes 4 0. Thank you, Ms. Dealey Cools. Next on the agenda, consideration of enacting ordinance number 21 09, age qualified overlay. Mr. Esposito. Uh, yes, as the board recalls, at our last meeting, we held a uh, public hearing to uh, consider an ordinance that would create an age qualified overlay district, uh, mainly being put on the property known as the Stone Farm. Uh, at the last meeting, the, uh, we held the meeting, uh, held the hearing, closed the record. The board continued the vote because we were still waiting for some signatures on settlement documents that was related to the Stone Farm litigation. Uh, I want to report to the board that we have received all signatures required. Uh, so I would suggest to the board that they can now make a motion on the proposed ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Esposito. Do any board members have any questions for Mr. Esposito? I'll move to approve and adopt the proposed ordinance of Middletown Township amending the township zoning ordinance and zoning map in order to create an age qualified overlay zoning district at the property located along Route 413, Tollgate Road and Fulling, Min Fulling Mill Road in Middletown Township, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, more formally known as Bucks County Tax Parcel ID number 22-005-007. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Payne. There's been a motion and a second. Any board questions? Any questions from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4-0. Thank you, Mr. Esposito. Next on the agenda, consideration of authorizing the purchase of a 2022 New Holland Power Star turbo diesel 90 horsepower tractor equipped with Alamo 17 foot dual wing interstater with rear flail mower for a total cost of $142,296.25. Mr. Gartmeyer. Good evening, board members. Um, in your packet, you'll have an outline, um, just explain a little bit um, how much grass we cut um, and the need for the tractor um, versus the zero turns. They each have their own uh, job, kind of. Um, you know, going with a zero turn, if we went with all zero turns, you would have to have equivalent to almost five zero turns out cutting to do one job of the tractor out cutting. So, you know, it gets into manpower and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, we did look at um, two different tractors, one being a John Deere and one being a New Holland. The New Holland uh, came in at a better price. And um, you'll notice it is a little bit higher than the original budget price. That was due to the cost of everything going up, um, as everything does. So um, at this time, I would recommend that we go with this piece of machinery. Um, it is different than our other one. Um, it does have a slighter big cut, a wider cut. It is an enclosed cab, which the weather and everything won't affect the guys. Um, usually now with the open cab, starts raining, they, they had to, have to you know, head back in. So that's a plus with that also. And safety-wise also, to keep our, you know, my guys out of the elements too. So I'd recommend going with the uh, New Holland tractor. And just um, for the sake of the record, we budgeted for this um, in the capital fund at $140,000, and it's coming in at $142,296.25, correct? That is correct. Yes, that was due to the uh, uh, cost. And I believe, um, talking with the dealer, um, there's going to be another increase coming shortly. Any board members have questions for Mr. Garten Mayor? If not, I'll accept the motion. I move to authorize the purchase of one 2022 New Holland Power Star enclosed 90 horsepower tractor equipped with Alamo 17 inch dual wing interstater with rear frail mower from Cherry Valley Tractor Sales of Marlton, New Jersey for the total of $142,296.25. Thank you, Ms. Corporal. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Payne. There's been a motion and a second. Any board questions? Any questions from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 4-0. Thank you, Mr. Gartmeyer. Thank you. Next on the agenda, consideration of authorizing preparation and advertisement of bid documents for the Swift Road, Woodburn Road signalization project. Uh, Ms. Tioli Cools. I'm going to start off with a brief history of this project. We have received uh, some interest in the last week. Uh, I thought it might be smart to just give a general background for those members of the public who are in attendance, uh, both 
in favor of and opposed to the project. Um, the project was first um, brought to Middletown Township uh, from the grassroots. There was a group of residents, two of them leaders, back in 2017. Um, their concerns were um, uh, near misses and collisions at the intersection. Um, a concern about uh, uh, the public safety uh, and for residents uh, and the community as a whole. So uh, 2018, so I would, you know, I'm gonna say it was like October of 2017 was a couple of emails that I found today. Um, the Board of Supervisors established the Citizens Traffic Commission in 2018, and this is one of the first issues that the Citizens Traffic Commission addressed. Um, uh, Traffic Planning and Design, our traffic engineer in February of 2018 initiated a warrant analysis. Um, this project was on the agenda of and in the minutes of three of the Citizens Traffic Commission meetings, um, open to the public. So um, in 2018, in May and July, uh, later in that year, and uh, during the budget process, the Citizens Traffic Commission recommended to the board that this go to the budget. Um, so the 2019 budget did include an allocation for the signal. It was a $300,000 allocation. Um, so not a whole lot happened in 2019. This is a project that didn't have a priority one designation for the residents. Um, when we're doing our capital planning, we identify priority one and priority two for the capital projects. Priority one are those that um, typically receive funding in any given year. In 2020, the capital plan and the budget process, again, this issue came up. Um, at this point, the funding allocation was increased. There was discussion at the time of there being two portions of the project, the road widening portion and the signalization project. And so at that point in 2020, the road widening was given uh, a priority one and the signalization a priority two. Um, so it was late in 2020 that it really became an issue that was part of the public discussion during your meetings of the Board of Supervisors. So on October 5th, on October 26th, on November 16th and December 7th, all 2020, there was extensive public discussion as the board was addressing this as a potential capital project. Um, you know, in general, I would say there were about 10 people that were um, most active in the discussions. At one meeting, when the board was voting on the budget, um, there were quite a few folks there. Um, again, each time that the issue came up, it was uh, the concern of the residents was the safety. Um, we do know the traffic uh, warrant uh, analysis uh, that was done by TPD. The signal is warranted by uh, PennDOT standards due to the volume of uh, the cars that are moving through the intersection daily and um, not due to the number of accidents. Um, again, I'm gonna reiterate the residents who were very vocal during this time were concerned that the accident data did not reflect the dangerous situation um, because they talked about the many times that they um, noted not just near misses, but you know accidents that weren't reportable to the police department. So at that point, back in December of 2020, the Board of Supervisors did adopt the budget that included this project um, as a priority one. And so um, the plan at that time uh, was again to look at it as, you know, road widening potentially with the road improvement plan and the signalization to be bid. Um, Remington Vernick engineers uh, did their survey work during 2021. In the spring of 2021, TPD continued their design work and began working with PennDOT. 
Um, basically what happened in 2021 is that the project wasn't ready to be bid in time for the construction season. And that is why even though it was identified in 2021 as a priority, um, it did then move to the 2022 capital plan. And so the 2022 capital plan does include $600,000 for the total project for the widening and the signalization. So that's the history. Um, I'd like to ask our traffic engineer, Phil Wursta, to come to the podium to explain to the board and the community um, what's uh, proposed to happen at the intersection. Um, and I will just um, you know, make sure that I'm clear that what is on your plate tonight is to authorize moving forward with the bid documents and advertising the bid. This would still need to come back to the board. Should you authorize moving forward, Tonight, it will still need to come back to the board once it is bid for the contract authorization. There was some confusion from some of the residents in favor that they thought it was already sort of a done deal and they weren't understanding that it still has to come before the board these two times. So, Phil, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coles, members of the board. Uh, just a, a, a br little brief overview of what we've done with regard to the design. First, uh, at the time when, when this was first brought up, traffic counts and studies were done uh, and submitted to PennDOT with regard to the warranting of the traffic signals. There's certain volume thresholds that are, that are federally regulated and state regulated, the same regulation regarding the warranting of a traffic signal. Uh, once you meet those types of guidelines, uh, it's, and, and things are brought up from a perspective of safety and so forth like that, it's, it's pretty much incumbent upon the agency, whether it's PennDOT or a municipality, to follow through with some sort of plan associated with that traffic signal warranting. Uh, in this location, uh, the signal, again, is warranted, a significant amount of volume on Woodburn Road and Lower State Road, and it was deemed and vetted by PennDOT that it was appropriate to put a traffic signal at this location. At that time, and as Ms. Uh, Tully Coles pulled out, or uh, pointed out, that uh, we went through the township process associated with the design work, approvals from the board, and so forth, and came up with uh, the design that you see in front of you. And I'd like to just take you through that a little bit. Uh, right now, uh, there's a, a stop-controlled intersection at, at, at the uh, Lower Silver Lake and at Swift Road. Uh, each, uh, the, the Swift Road is one lane coming out, and Lower Silver Lake is, uh, is also one lane going into the intersection. The intersection of, uh, on each side of Woodburn, it's one lane in each direction. An interesting point here is that Lower Silver Lake is a township road. The, I'm gonna call it the south part, yeah, the south part of Woodburn is a state road. The north part of Woodburn is one of our roads and Swift is obviously one of our roads. So three out of the four inter, uh, roadways are Middletown's uh, roadways. Uh, when we put the design in for the intersection, we accommodated pedestrians, which is something that's mandatory now with PennDOT to take a look at pedestrian access. And as you know, we try to get as much pedestrian flow as possible. So we're accounting for pedestrian access there with crosswalks and ADA ramps. We are also adding a left turn lane. Anytime a signal's put in now, we always recommend a left turn lane. Number one, it gets people out of the way. So there's the less impact of uh, first uh, a car holding up a line of traffic to make a left, and also it reduces the, uh, the opportunity of having uh, rear end collisions. So getting left turns out of the way is really important. So that was done as part of this process as well. The road widening was an interesting one. There was a bump out of, I'll call it, just an island of, or a peninsula of, of 
tree, some scrub trees and dirt along uh, our side of Woodburn Road on the, uh, on the swift side of Woodburn. So right below essentially the, the word road in Woodburn on the plan, there was a bump out of, of, that constricted the, the width of the road. We're essentially carving that off and making it a, a, a wider lane of traffic to be able to accommodate the left turn lanes. As part of that, we're also gonna be milling and overlaying this section of road, about 450 feet. Along that stretch of road, we are extending the left turn lane from the Newtown Bypass back to uh, pretty far. In fact, there's a gourd area that you see in the middle there. We're now turning that into a, essentially a center left turn lane. So that's gonna open up significantly the amount of traffic that can be moved from Woodburn Road from the, coming from the south through the intersection to the Newtown Bypass. We're also, tying this traffic signal into the Newtown Bypass traffic signal system. and working with PennDOT and Newtown regarding that change as part of this project. What that's gonna do is lengthen the left turn arrow as you make a left from Woodburn Road uh, onto the Newtown Bypass toward uh, Northampton and Newtown. So that's an, that's an improvement to the intersection. Uh, there will be a left turn arrow provided for turns from Woodburn Road onto Lower Silver Lake Road. There, uh, that's a significant amount of lefts now in PennDOT's eyes that, that again met a threshold and PennDOT mandated the use of a left turn arrow in that location because of those lefts. So the timing of all this with regard to the bypass and this intersection are done based upon all of our fancy computer analysis and so forth, and tying into the adaptive signal system that, that we have on the Newtown Bypass. Uh, some other highlights, let's see, are, we're replacing guide rail, bringing our guide rail up to standards along the stretch of road. Uh, we're putting in, um, some uh, drainage facilities because of the spread of the water right now comes out into the road. We reduce, it's called a spread. Whenever you see a puddle on the side of the road, PennDOT doesn't call it a puddle, they call it a spread. And that is, that we're reducing that by putting in some, uh, some drainage facilities. Those are, um, so we can avoid icing and that sort of thing in the, in the winter. So essentially you're gonna have a new modernized intersection. Uh, with, we're also lighting the intersection with, with, uh, with luminaires because we are gonna have pedestrian facilities in that location. So this is gonna be an up-to-date, modernized, signalized intersection. We feel that it's gonna take uh, great care with regard to the amount of traffic that's going through that intersection and the ability to handle it very, very nicely. Uh, we expect queue lengths to be minimal uh, at, at any time during the, uh, from the amount of cars and traffic that we see there. So we're not gonna see many backups on, on these roads. I think the, the, gra the greatest one will be about 140 feet, which is seven cars on Lower State, on Lower, Lower Silver Lake Road. And we're gonna have at the most uh, 15 cars lined up at one time on Woodburn Road, all being able to clear during a cycle length and then move through the bypass signal as well. So I think we have most of that, almost everything covered that we can think of with regard to the operation of this intersection to make sure it's, it, it, it does what it's supposed to do and it's as painless as possible for anybody that's not used to having a traffic signal in that location. Adaptive, the adaptive. Yeah, uh, yeah, the adapt, it'll, it, it will, will not, it'll be tied into the adaptive system. Uh, the issue of it being adaptive is, is unclear at this point. We're talking with PennDOT with regard to how that works. And the, the point of that is that the adaptive system on the bypass is really geared to move traffic back and forth on the bypass. So PennDOT wants to make sure that what we're doing does not 
take away from that bypass traffic flow. So the question of whether we have an adaptive system that changes based upon the volumes, it's likely that we have one, but it may not be as, it's still gonna be a slave to the Newtown bypass traffic, because it's that close. But again, we don't see it being as any issue. Thank you, Mr. Worcester. Um, do any board members have questions for Mr. Worcester or Ms. Yoli Cools or comments generally about the project? So I just wanted to ask, I know we got some uh, concerns from some residents in the area that there would be cut through traffic because there would be backup with this second light. So what I'm hearing you say, if I'm, if, am I hearing you say that you don't think that's a concern because it's going to be timed and there, because of the left-hand turn singles? Um, you address that concern? Well, yes. I mean, anytime you put a traffic light in, it's going to turn red, and when it turns red, we're going to have you're going to have cars backed up at that red light. The maximum impact that we see on, as an example, as I said, was Upper or uh, Silver Lake Road, was 148 feet. It's about it's about seven cars. Uh, those car the the intersection at at Eaglesmere on low, uh, is is about 450 feet. So that won't even come close to that. And we feel that we're gonna move that out. There's not gonna be any incentive to turn into the neighborhood, to meander through that neighborhood, to come back out onto Woodburn and deal with the same traffic that's going, that's going that way. You know, they're making the left to go past, uh, past the, the access at the, the neighborhood that's closer to Ellis Road. So uh, we, we don't see that as being something that's gonna happen at all. Same thing the other direction. The maximum queue length will be about 300 feet. You can't even see that from the bottom of the hill toward, toward Ellis to be able to make that turn into, into Eaglesmere. So uh, again, we expect that to move quickly. Uh, so we're not, we're not expecting that we're gonna have any backups that are of, of significant or no, any different than anywhere else that would certainly cause, we, last thing we wanna do is cause a problem going through a, a residential neighborhood. And I, I should point out that both PennDOT and our office are monitor these things for the first 90 days to make sure that these types of things aren't happening. So. Yeah, I think one of, I, I know, you know, I utilize this this intersection on a, on a regular basis, um, going back and forth to, to my parents. So I know the queue that occurs. Um, so have we taken into consideration, you know, seven cars? We know that there's a proposed Wawa at the beginning of Lower Silver Lake. Have we thought through the impact of that? And additionally, is the queuing based off of times today or based on times of 2018 when we first did the study? Um, the queuing is based upon the, the traffic from 2018 with extrapolated growth volumes between now and then. So it was, it was pre-pandemic when we took the original counts and we're building post-pandemic, which is, which is a little bit, probably a little bit less than what it was just before still. Uh, so, but we, the answer to your question is we do not have new traffic counts associated with that, uh, but we will. So, and we'll adjust the times accordingly. Yeah, um, and, and from a PennDOT standpoint, you had said that I didn't realize PennDOT was one of the, the kind of the four intersections. So do they provide funding if given that we have to put this in, considering they're, they have one of the, like one of the road? Sadly, no. It's an unfunded mandate. And since we have this, this traffic warrant, are there other ways that we can address the situation, like the road widening um, and the turn lanes? Does that do enough to address not necessarily needing a, a signal there? Because um, I did hear a lot of resident feedback around the signal, and that's really, they agree that, you know, something needs to be done, but the traffic signal seems like a nuclear option, you know. Um, well, I, 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 I don't agree with that. I mean, I understand that's an opinion that, that's out there. Uh, the, uh, we looked at a, a multi-stop multi condition, a multi-way stop, a four-way stop, I should say, easier to comprehend, uh, and that really makes the intersection work terribly. 
especially on Woodburn Road. So um, it, it really, it really does not help in any way with regard to that. Uh, adding the left turn lanes helps at any intersection, gets people out of the way, and it, it's a safer thing. It's a safety issue more so than a volume issue with regard to putting in left turn lanes. So the answer to that is the signal is the best way to accommodate all the traffic in on the, especially the main, the three main flows of traffic, Woodburn, both legs of Woodburn and Lower Silver Lake. So I know before we had talked about doing this in two phases, are we talking now about doing this pretty much all at once now? Okay, that's one, just, I wanted to be clear. About yes, that. and the sequence of construction would be, the roadway work would be done first. Traffic signal poles will be ordered. Uh, we had some good news uh, earlier this week that signal poles were taking six months and so forth but, uh, due to supply chain issues and everything else, but it looks like it's, uh, it's three to four months right now. So that's shrunk down uh, significantly. But the first thing that will be done will be the roadway work. Are there any residents that are along those those route the um, routes that are impacted significantly by the road widening from a noise pollution standpoint? Um, the only only change in the widening of the road is uh, is is moving it a little bit to the right as you come from uh, the north to the south, uh, a matter of about three feet. Uh, it still stays in the roadway network that's already out there. So there should be no impact associated with that. The area where we're taking down uh, the, the scrub trees and that sort of thing, they're, they're all within the township's right of way. They're a hazard right now, and we're moving that to improve the left turn lane. It's my opinion that that's not gonna make any difference associated with the, the, sig the, the noise from traffic in just that area. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Worsta or Ms. Tioli Cools? If not, what I'd like to do is open it up for public comment at this time. I know we have a number of people in the audience who have uh, positions on this particular issue. So if anybody would like to comment on this, um, yes sir, with your hand up, you can go first. Just please come up to the podium and state your name and address. Hi. Uh, Rich Brodsky, I live at uh, 355 Cottonwood Drive, which is in the Eaglesmere community. Uh, I am here with several of my community members tonight, and I want to thank you all. Uh, I want to thank you for the history regarding this particular project and all of the information about the, the safety. I think everyone in our community is very interested in the safety of everyone in the area, but we do have concern that we may be sacrificing the safety of, of our community in order to make the safety of the, of the intersection. Uh, I will tell you, I, I appreciate the thought that seven cars will not cause people to come down our lane, but uh, right now, while there is no traffic light right there, uh, we see cars cut through our community all the time. Uh, without that level of seven cars, only the two or three that you had mentioned, we already see uh, a lot of traffic cut through. That is before a light, and that is before a super Wawa that will be at the other entrance of Silver Lake Road. Uh, we, what we want from uh, the township as far as this project goes, but number one, as you mentioned, we, we are against the light. Uh, a large portion of us are against the light for this reason but we want some level of assurance that there will be some way to control any traffic that would want to bypass through our, excuse me, through our community. Uh, many of us have been discussing multiple options for this, which would include any, uh, any amenable conditions that would prevent any cars from cutting, from, who do not have business within our community from using it as a second bypass. Uh, it's a by, it would be a bypass to the bypass to go around our community and uh, directly from the Super Wawa onto Woodbourne Road. Uh, our options we talked about were speed bumps all the way down to closing off the entrance to Silver Lake Road to our community and making a one-way entrance. Uh, we would prefer not to have to do any of these options as it would, you know, uh, I know it's been a project long going, but this is our concern. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Greg Nada. I live at 308 Swift Road, Langhorne, PA. So I've been living in this community for about 20 to 30 years and I know this intersection very well. 
I believe that this light is an overstatement. Um, I was going through, I just moved back to the area and I'm going through the uh, meeting notes and I was trying to find like the incident reports that you talked about and I saw in 2000, uh, December 7, 2022, uh, there was 11 injuries over three years. That was the data that was presented. So that's, it's a very low number. Um, I know exactly like where these accidents are occurring, what time, because 90% of the time I get out of my neighborhood, there's no traffic. There's no real reason to put a light there. What happens is during, you know, one time during rush hour, when people try to make that left or right onto uh, Swift Road, as people make that left, um, there's people on that shoulder. I don't know if you can put that uh, picture back up of the, um, the map, but people go around the car, and as people go make the left-hand turn, that's how they get clipped. And I feel that the data shows that there really wasn't that many injuries. Yes. I believe the gentleman over here was talking about that shoulder they want to widen up. So if you can imagine coming from the Newtown Bypass and making a, um, or from the south side into the, make a left into the uh, Swift Road, as someone makes that left, someone is gonna be coming down Woodburn from North Sound to South Sound. They don't see that car coming, and that's where most of the collisions happen. But the data showed that there really wasn't that many. And um, overall, they just, I believe that, I said like not, most of the time, there's not an incident or an issue getting in and out of this uh, neighborhood. And I don't, I don't believe there needs to be a, a traffic uh, installment at this location. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes, ma'am. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name is Dawn Smith. I live at 512 White Swan Way. I've lived there since 1987. I have watched, the whole thing changed. I've watched Double Woods Road become the Newtown Bypass. Um, I definitely feel that a light is necessary at this intersection. Unfortunately, I have to disagree. There's a lot of traffic in the morning and in the evenings where making the left out of Swift to go up towards the Newtown Bypass can somewhat be impossible. Um, you have people that are coming off the bypass at a high rate of speed, um, and by the time they reach our neighborhood, when someone is trying to make a left, they come around us, or around that car, and will often come very close to the entrance. Now, the widening would definitely help that, but um, when you were trying to come out, it, it can be very, very difficult. Um, as far as coming from the other direction, from uh, Lower Silver Lake Road, um, I've had, we had an instance with my family that they didn't, the driver actually didn't see the stop sign and he came completely out and collided with another car coming from the bypass and then those two cars collided into a car coming out of Silver, or out of Swift Road rather, which happened to contain two of my children. So, obviously I have a very different um, meaning for this project, but I've seen the danger that occurs at this intersection all the time. 2010, we had a fatality on December 23rd, um, and uh, right at that same intersection. So, for me, I think that Without a doubt, while I love all the widening and I do think that's going to help, I definitely think that the light will be necessary because the widening of that road gives people coming off the bypass that much more power to come because now there's a lane that someone turning left is there so they can just keep coming. So if I'm trying to make my left out of Swift, there's, there's nothing to say that, you know, at that rate of speed, that that couldn't cause another problem. So for me, I think the light is necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Natalie O'Donnell from Middletown. I don't live near the intersection, but I've been a resident for 25 years and I have many friends in that general area and it is a known dangerous intersection and I think the only people that are opposing it are those that live across the street in that Eagles Mirror development because they're worried about 
people cutting through their development. That is not a reason to stop a safety measure in our township. If the intersection warrants it based on the volume of the cars, which are only probably going to increase as the next few years occur, we pretty much are certain that Wawa's probably coming and that's not a Middletown decision. So I think that would only help that situation if the Wawa does get approved and um, there's money in the budget. It was already brought into the budget. We're doing very well in Middletown right now if we look at our 2021 and 2022 projections. So you can't say that we don't have the money for it and there's already a proven traffic study with traffic volume with PennDOT supporting it and there's a known dangerous accident area. So I don't really support the opposition of it and I'm very much in favor of a light as well as the road, road expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. Good evening, board. Pat Mallon, 385 Cottonwood Drive, Langhorne. Um, first off, um, I appreciate the board giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Um, with respect to communication, I have to disagree. Um, I know it's been discussed as part of public comment, but that's my backyard, okay? I've lived at that intersection for 22 years. Um, I know all about the accidents. Uh, often I'm the first person on site, either administering first aid or calling emergency services well aware of that 2010 accident. I was a, an elected board member for a month when that happened. Um, what happened there was it was an impaired driver that ran a driver off the road. It was an illegal am immigrant. And, um, and unfortunately, that poor person died as a result of that accident. So to me, the communication has not been good. And if it was good, you wouldn't have this sudden group of people saying, hey, wait a minute. Um, and look, I'm not saying not in my backyard. I have a tremendous amount of uh, respect for Phil Worsta. I hired him, okay? So if Phil and the chief and the other experts can guarantee that this light is gonna solve a problem and not create another problem, even though it's in my backyard, I can get behind that. But my concern is, and I tried to do this when I was up there, as you are. Uh, first reached out to Chief Kane about the number of accidents and the serious, seriousness of the accidents. And I asked the chief, can you investigate? I mean, again, I'm there. I'm pulling people out of cars. I'm calling emergency services. Uh, chief Kane at the time looked at the numbers, checked with PennDOT, came back to me and said, Pat, there's not a lot we can do about it. It's driver negligence or it's driver error. Okay, fine. As a chairman, I asked your uh, uh, current chief, Chief Bartarella, Joe, still seen a lot of accidents out there. Can you look into it for me? Chief Bartarella did, came back with the same data. So the traffic light can control traffic. The traffic light cannot control bad drivers. And unfortunately, that is the reason why we're having accidents there. Um, I, if I'm gonna make a left-hand turn, I never make a left-hand turn there. I go down to the other entrance out of, out of Eagle's Mirror. So, so again, um, at the end of the day, I want what's best for this community. I want what's best for the traffic on Woodburn Road. But my concern is, and my, my question is, why haven't we tried other traffic calming measures before this? Why haven't we tried dangerous intersection ahead? Why haven't we tried stop signs? I mean, you can always take those signs down and they don't cost anything because public works can make them with their sign machine. My concern with the light is once that light goes up, even if this becomes the worst intersection in Bucks County, it's never coming down. It's never coming down. So we're gonna spend the money, we're gonna put it up there. And if that's what you do, I pray to God it's the right step, and I, and I pray to God that it reduces accidents and fatalities, and it makes it a better community, because this is where I live, this is where I raise my kids, and this is where I'm staying. But I don't think anybody, even Phil, as, as much as I respect him as a traffic engineer, I don't think Phil can make that guarantee. Because what I heard Phil say was, 
We will deal with things as they come up. And I have full confidence he will, but I don't think that that's how we should go into this. I know, I think it was last year, there was a, um, uh, a convening of residents in Highland Park to talk about traffic issues. Why don't we do that here? Again, I respect my friends in Swan Point. I respect my fr friends and neighbors in Eaglesmere. We're all on the same page. There's no reason to have the Hatfields and McCoys over this. We all want the same thing. So I would ask this board to at least consider all of the community and I would ask you to ask yourself, is this the best thing that we can do? Thank you. Has this been a topic of discussion on one a line item on the Board of Supervisors so that residents that live in those areas can know about it specifically related to this intersection? At the Citizens Traffic Commission level, it has. At the board level, only as part of the capital plan discussions. Mr. Warren. Andy Warren, Shady Brook Drive, and I use that intersection many, 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 many times. I have more questions <clears throat> that um, I would ask for just to see where we are. Um, I understand that there, the intersection by volume meets a PennDOT or federal criteria. My question was, and I don't know, and I don't need these answers right this minute, but I would hope someone would check them. What are, what are the number of vehicles that go through an intersection in a, an eight hour period or whatever hour that formula is that warrants a light, that would be one. Um, two, I keep hearing this is a dangerous intersection and there have been crashes there for any number of reasons. Um, but I suspect in Bucks County there exists or at least within PennDOT, or maybe within TBD, there exists a listing of most dangerous intersections in any community. If that exists, where does this intersection fall on that, on that um, listing? The other question, and, and, it's, and I learned, and this, this would be the third light within a half mile, within, yeah, within a half mile, um, from the bypass to, to um, where the light is proposed, is a tenth, two, a tenth, two tenths of a mile, tenth and a half, I measured it with a car. And then another three tenths, we've got the other light down by the today, where today used to be, with at least one or two other roads coming in between them. So my question comes back to, and I, and I heard that there was a, a study, a review of a four-way stop sign. Um, I learned many things in while well, I was at PennDOT, and many of them are really were quite odd. That in order to form a speed limit, we take the 85, 85th percentile of what people travel, and that's what the safe speed is. Um, so if residents think it ought to be 35, but 85% of the people are going 50, <laughs> you can fit that in there as a safe speed. My question that I all, the other thing that I did learn or heard, ironically, when there is a red light, and particularly if there are a series of red lights in close proximity, ironically, a driver, some drivers, will come and speed up to get through a yellow light. And if there is a stop sign, at the very worst, they'll slow down for a rolling stop, a rolling stop through the stop sign. So, the irony of all of this is, one, if this is not one of the really dangerous intersections by numbers, 
if in fact the majority of crashes that do occur there wouldn't be impacted one way or the other by stop sign or red light, then are we not perhaps trying to address the annihilation of a flea with a sledgehammer? I don't, a red light I could work, but it also could cause people to speed up because it's third one going through there. And what is the amount of volume going through here and where else? I, I keep think as I drive through Bucks County, going up from the community college to Doylestown, that intersection where, where they're fixing the road now, up the top of the hill, where you've got the cars on Swamp Road and, and trucks coming through that intersection has warrants four-way stop sign. Now, if anybody in the world could use a red light, it would be there, but it's been deemed four-way stop sign might be the best way to handle that. So all of those questions I would ask, um, and I, would, uh, I think it would be helpful to residents if they knew, well, you know, um, there's two ways that you can require a, stop, a red light. Middletown, you make it on one, the other one you don't. Um, there are far more dangerous intersections um, in Bucks County, in Middletown than this one. There's just, I think, a, a fair number of questions. And I appreciate the fact that three years ago or so, uh, and I mean this seriously, that this issue was publicly discussed at a um, traffic commission group. Um, and that's all well and good. Um, now it's going to happen, and people are really paying attention. Um, so I think it would be very helpful for all if there were some kind of a review and just say, hey, yes, red light's been discussed, but there are other alternatives that could be just as effective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Um, yes, ma'am. State your name and address, please. Hi, good evening. My name's Donna Salvucci. I live at 144 Pine Glen, and I'm here with my husband, Lou Salvucci. Um, first of all, I wanna thank um, everyone here tonight for all the information. Um, I think all of you know that I've been working um, to address the safety intersection issues um, with all of you since 2017, as Stephanie mentioned. I appreciate the very thorough history that was given and, and certainly the um, traffic engineer proposal, which uh, I think really um, adds to a lot of the safety issues that we've brought to the forefront over the past five years. Um, as a matter of record, it wasn't just us communicating at one citizens meeting, tra uh, traffic commission meeting. Um, many of us have been here and talked through the pandemic, whether it's Zoom or in person, at your meetings, um, at the citizens meeting, at traffic commission meetings, at budget meetings. So there's been a lot of opportunities for public forum and discussion with the agendas online, with video recordings of meetings. So, um, you know, I think it's great to, for everyone to have the history that this has been a public discourse and certainly that's what government's all about. It's certainly been a learning experience for me. It's my first civil action, I guess, so to speak. So, um, of course, I live in Swamp Point. My house faces the water basin so that I uh, literally have visible, clear visible sight of and earshot to all of the accidents that occur when I'm home. Our uh, family room faces the, uh, that intersection, as do some of our bedrooms. So as you've heard in the past, we hear the accidents, we call 911, we rush across the basin. I think the difference with Swamp Point and the 230 plus homes 
as compared to uh, the development across the street is that not only are there so many other families moving in and out of those intersections, so it's not just the people who travel up and down Woodburn that may have a different perception of the, the traffic, but people, the 230 families that may be using that intersection and egressing in and out of um, Swift onto Woodburn. Um, we hear there are probably 10 or 15 homes that are in earshot that visibly see these accidents, that respond to the accidents. And as was mentioned in the traffic report and the, main the other main concern, that data cannot ever capture is the constant screeching of tires, the near misses that happen over and over again. Um, and you know, thank you also to the police chief that worked very hard, and it, it took a lot of effort, I know, to get the accident data collection. It wasn't just a simple shot. It took three, um, three attempts was my understanding to get the accident data from all three different points of collection from the different, um, the different uh, streets. So the data collection went from 1999 to 2018. So it was a very big job and I appreciate that effort. And then after that, from 2018 to 2021, there were 14 additional accidents at our residential intersections. Many of them we have pictures of. These are not fender benders. These are cars that many of the times are taken away in flatbeds. These are people, these are fire responses. These are ambulance responses. Um, there were so many efforts from the speed flow studies that people did purposely not know about that were, that were undergone. People in the community may not realize in 2018, thanks to the police chief again, there was the portable speed sign. So people had awareness, how fast are you going? The horse is out there blinking, slow down. This is how fast you're going, this is the speed limit. These were things that were talked about at meetings that the township has helped us to deal with in hopes that we could get people to be aware, to slow down. Yet the accidents have continued even during the pandemic. So if we're thinking about the volume moving forward, as people go back to work, we know the accidents are happening at least at a rate of two to three per year. That if we're getting a Wawa, I don't know anything about the Wawa, the volume is gonna increase the act and people are going back to work, I think we can project based on the past that the accident rate will increase if we do nothing. The ge geographical physical layout to move into those intersections is impossible if you were to follow traffic law. If you were a permitted driver, you would never pass the test you would have to pull so far out into the intersection. If you were learning to take a, a driver's test, you would fail. You cannot possibly maneuver into that intersection safely from either uh, Lower Silver or Swift. You have to pull out into an unsafe spot. You don't know that if you're just a community member driving up and down. Um, so, I know there's been exhaustive reviews. I understand the engineer, traffic engineer's recommendations after living there for so many years and knowing that this did not start in 2017. This review happened and these safety issues were brought to the board at least 10 years prior. And I know that from the, um, the director of parks and transportation who told me that um, in a conversation about my safety concerns right before she retired, she said, go back to the township, go back. These are safety reports that came up 10 years before. So we're talking about 2010. These have gone on and on. And again, I appreciate everyone's efforts here. I appreciate the history. I appreciate the engineers. I appreciate the concerns of our neighbors across the, across the way. And I hope that there's some way that we can address them. But quite frankly, one of the things that the data cannot capture is that people in our development, we changed our behavior. And that will change data. We tell people do not use the intersection at Swift and Woodbourne. Go around and use the other intersection in and out of our development, which means that alters the data. So 
Hopefully people are doing that. And we tell people visiting our neighborhood, don't go in and out of there. It's a death trap. It's an accident waiting to happen. So whatever data capture we have, we can actually say that there's probably a, a higher incident of accidents that could happen, but people in our development, in those 230 plus homes, many of them actively avoid that intersection. So again, thank you for your time tonight. I, I really hope that the plans move forward because I really do think it's the best for our community. And I appreciate the five years that all of you have been working on that with us. Please just state your name and address, thanks. Yes, I am Virginia Walsh. I live at 313 White Swan Way. Um, I am not gonna repeat anything that I've probably already said here uh, last year or the year before that. Um, I agree with everything that Donna had brought up. Um, I thank you for all the studies that you guys have done and all the hard work and planning in particular that you've put into this and all the, the answers that you've been able to provide. I think one of the things I just wanted to point out here um, after listening to a bunch of people and a lot of people that are concerned about things that are uh, happening particularly that could potentially happen in the neighborhood across the street. Um, one of the things is we mentioned the Wawa company in. Um, the, the problem that I see here that maybe hasn't also been talked about is that when you put a Wawa at the end of that roadway, you're going to have a lot of kids trying to go to that Wawa. They're going to ride their bikes there. They're going to try to get over there. They're going to try to walk over there. That's pretty much one of the only things they're going to be able to get to on their bikes or on foot. They're going to be, from my neighborhood, going straight across that street. The people in the neighborhood across the street don't have to worry about that with their children. They're already on the other side of that roadway. They're already on the other side of that intersection. But the children in my neighborhood have to worry about that. I have a right to raise my children safely. I'm currently raising them in that neighborhood. I have a right not to worry about them being in a car and getting hurt. When we're making a left out of our intersection, the other neighborhood doesn't have to make a left there to get to the bypass. We have to make the left. We have people coming down that roadway and cutting over where there now would be a left turn lane. They're trying to go around and we're sitting ducks just stopped there trying to get onto that roadway. I've seen a gentleman who lives close to that corner who's actually been hit and his vehicle was pushed into the Swan Point sign just from sitting there waiting because of what's been happening at that intersection. There, there can't be an argument that it's it's just not dangerous. And, and we even had someone that might be questioning it that says he doesn't even use the intersection because he knows it's dangerous. If that's what's going on, then the solution is to try to find something that makes it safer. And I'm not trying to discount what people are concerned about in their neighborhood. If I had cars that were being rerouted and coming faster through my neighborhood, I'd be concerned too, primarily number one, because of safety. This intersection, our main concern here is safety. So if we make a different decision or we change our minds when we have all of the evidence and all of the facts that have now been collected that the township has already spent the money on, we're now sitting here saying, wait a second, let's consider something else. And is that more important than safety? We already know it's unsafe. So if, if that's what we're gonna make the decision on, then I think you need to look through the forest through the trees. And then what is your decision being made upon? Is it aesthetics? Is it noise? Is it, I just don't want a lot of traffic? Or is it the safety of people going through that intersection? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? I, I'd like to actually ask our Chief of Police, Joe Bartarella, if he wouldn't mind just addressing this, only because he was mentioned by name by several different people already, and just to get his thoughts Uh, thank you, Mr. Kizak and uh, board. So I think the, the crowd knows what the, the stats are, what the data are. Uh, this is kind of taken on uh, more of like an emotional uh, issue. And I try to keep the police department out of that. I, we really like just like to, you know, operate based on what the facts are. And I think Mr. Worsted did a pretty good job of presenting that. So I'll just give the board and people who are here what my take is. It's a very high volume road. Uh, we actually did our own traffic study during the pandemic over Thanksgiving week and the week after in 2020. And over 14 days, there were about 118,000 vehicles 
if you count both directions. So it's very high volume. Uh, in uh, just anecdotally, not based on data, my initial reaction was to maybe try the, the four-way stop sign. Uh, I know Mr. Worcester, though, he, he gave me some good information as to why that, that wasn't really a, a feasible option. Um, he's much more you know, capable in, in traffic engineering than I am. Um, my issue with the, the traffic light, I think, is that it's needed, but only during certain peak times. There are certainly times on Woodburn Road when you're coming in and out of Swan Point where there's no cars maybe for 15 minutes at a time, like 11 o'clock at night on a weeknight in February or March. But there are times during the day we're trying to make a left out of Swan Point, uh, especially on Swift Road and even on White Swan Way. Uh, it's very difficult. You could be waiting a long time, and when you're coming off a swift road, the traffic that comes southbound onto Woodburn from the bypass is sometimes difficult to see, especially as they work up to uh, a high speed. So uh, one of the things I had mentioned to Mr. Worcester was maybe getting a traffic light out there um, and then putting it on flash when it wasn't, you know, peak times. Uh, this way it wouldn't disrupt any traffic flow. As far as what the intersection will look like if a light is out there. Uh, I don't think it's fair to, to, to ask me or Mr. Worse that. And, and we, there's no way we could say for sure what would happen, especially when you're building a Wawa and, and you know the dynamics of traffic are changing constantly with the added volume um, to the roadways. Uh, I will say this. Um, I know that after Ben Salem Township, Middletown Township, we have the second most crashes of any municipality in Bucks County. I know pre-pandemic, Ben Salem would average around 3,000 crashes a year. We were about 1,800. Bristol was right behind us at 1,700, and then Falls and Warminster right behind there. So we do have a lot of traffic volume through our township. It is a, a very big challenge for us. I don't think it's going to get any less. And I did see in an email um, a few years ago to our township manager, I did say to her that there needs to be some type of traffic control at that intersection because especially during peak times, it, it is very dangerous and very difficult to, to exit that intersection, especially making a left. I don't know if that beats around the bush or if that answers your question at all. You know, I'm, I'm trying to give uh, an answer, you know, based on, on what we see as a police department. It's obviously a very emotional issue on both sides, uh, but I would say that there, there has to be some type of control out there. I think the volume does warrant it, especially given that over 14 days you're seeing 100,000 or more cars bypass that, that intersection. And since 2018, I know Ms. Salvucci had the, the data from 99 to 2018. Uh, what I looked, she said 14, there, there were 13 crashes that I saw last night when I looked at the data, and, and four of them would be considered very serious, right? One was a pedestrian actually struck. There was actually another pedestrian struck, they called it in and never wanted to really make a formal report. So uh, we do get some pretty serious uh, crashes out there. You know, I, I know one per year doesn't sound serious, but when you're talking about a pedestrian getting struck or a serious crash resulting in multiple injuries, even one per year at an intersection like that, I think would be considered fairly serious. Um, that being said, it's, it's definitely the board's decision how you, you want to proceed, but that's our take. If, if you have any specific questions for me, I'd, I'd be happy to answer, or give my, my opinion on anything. Have we ever tried um, policing that intersection? You know, so one thing I did there? see, Ms. King, when I looked up the, the data uh, last night, is every time we do a speed detail or a traffic detail, we have to document it on an incident report. And we had 15 of them. So, so, and, and that was, I, I went back a little further. I, I wanted to go back to before that, that serious DUI crash that Mr. Mallon talked about in 2010. So I went back to 2009. So we do do speed details out there. Uh, the one thing I, I want you to, 15 may not sound a lot over the span of 10 years or so, but when you consider uh, all of the township roads, we have like 220 plus mile of road, uh, miles of roadway and we get requests to do speed details all over the place. That's actually a lot for that specific portion of roadway. Any other questions? Any other questions from the chief? Thank you, chief. Appreciate You're welcome. it. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we've obviously heard a lot of public comment on on 
I guess, varying sides of the issue, and I want to thank Mr. Worcester for um, his thorough review. I want to thank Ms. Tioli Cools for her thorough review of the history of this project. I want to thank the chief for offering his input. Um, this, it's interesting. This is an issue where when it first came before us several years ago, um, I'll admit I was um, reluctant to put a traffic signal at this location. To me, it seemed, um, it seemed like overkill. Um, and I thought, at least initially, that the accident data, while not insignificant, didn't necessarily justify it. Um, and, you know, one of the things Mr. Warren mentioned, he asked a question, is this one of the most dangerous uh, intersections in the county? Certainly not. I don't think anybody ever suggested necessarily that this is one of the most dangerous intersections in the county. I'm not even sure it cl would classify as one of the most dangerous intersections in the township. Um, but I think what we've learned over the ensuing years as we've continued to talk to residents, as we've continued to investigate the situation, is that there's a larger issue at play here, and it's volume, it's traffic volume. And I think, in a large degree, safety, car accidents, and volume, they all go hand in hand. Um, and, and I came here tonight with um, a truly an open mind. We've heard, I would say, predominantly from those over the last several years who are strongly in favor of this particular project. We had not, until very recently, heard from many people who were opposed to it. I talked to a lot of people. When, when this first came up, I kind of made my own effort to reach out to people that I knew in these neighborhoods to get, to get uh, input. I got a lot of people that were in favor of signalization. I got a lot of people that I would classify as neutral. Um, I didn't get a, a lot of opposition. Um, recently, we've had opposition, which is for the most part coming from residents of the Eagles Mare neighborhood. And most of the, at least the comment I've heard tonight and that I've seen from, uh, from people in that neighborhood pertains to concern about people using their neighborhood as a cut through, which I absolutely understand and validate. That's, that's a serious concern. Um, and one that I would be strongly in favor of looking into further. And if your neighborhood is willing to consider um, some manner of traffic calming measures speed bumps, signage, what have you, I mean, I'm on board. I mean, it's, it's your neighborhood, and if you, you feel like that needs to happen, I'm, I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to consider it. However, my personal opinion is that I don't think I heard anything tonight that, at least in my mind, would justify changing the direction that we've been headed on this particular project or delaying making a decision on this. Um, I don't, I think, you know, there was talk about maybe doing four-way stop as opposed to signalization. I think Mr. Worcester's looked into that. I have a tremendous amount of trust and faith and respect for Mr. Worcester, tremendous amount of trust and respect for our chief. Um, at this point, I think that I personally have seen, read, and heard enough that I think that this, the, these, the combination of these road improvements and this signalization is a good thing um, at this location. And so I, I'm in favor of moving forward with it. Um, before I make a motion, though, I would like to give my fellow supervisors an opportunity to give their input, um, make comments. Um, I don't want it to be, uh, be the only one offering my, my, my feedback. My only, you know, I solicited a lot of feedback knowing that intersection. I solicited a lot of feedback from friends and family that live kind of and utilize that, that intersection. From a community standpoint, I think it would go a long way to outreach to those members before signing off on this and have them, like you said, get on board with understanding what this is going to do for that intersection and getting on board as to why it's needed. I think that would go a long way in, in, in just making a more of a community effort to make the best, you know, to help, you know, that intersection and create that intersection. That would be my only, that would be my only um, comment on that, doing it tonight and potentially delaying it so that we can make sure that all of the residents understand why this is necessary and ask their questions to um, the plan to, to really understand it and understand why it's not going to be an issue as a cut through, as, as Mr. Worcester had said, and why it's not going to be gridlocked at rush hour, because it is now, we know that, that Woodburn Road backs up. That would be my only thought, is just to make sure that we as a community move forward together and not divided. So I'm um, actually, I 
I agree, I understand what you're saying. I live in Highland Park, I'm a cut through, <laughs> I get it. We have talked about traffic calming there. Um, and one of the thoughts while I heard some of the residents talking was, you know, maybe we need to do the same thing. Maybe have a meeting with those residents about what can be done for traffic calming and get their opinions and, and you know, have somebody from the board and, and those residents there. However, I do agree with Mr. Kizak that um, we have been addressing this issue for a long time. We've had a lot of residents come out multiple times, um, and I, I, I know the area well as well, and uh, I, I agree that, you know, I, I did, you know, I have all faith in uh, Mr. Warzak, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, he thinks that this traffic light is, is the solution. Um, I think with, with the turning lights, with the widening, with the traffic light, this is a safety concern that we can address right now. Um, and it, it might not be the most dangerous in Bucks County, but if we have it in the budget, we have looked at this, we all agree that something needs to be done there. And I think this is the right thing to do and it's the right time to do it. But that being said, I don't wanna just, sorry, forget about the residents um, that are gonna be affected through the cut through and, and keep that conversation open. I do want to reiterate, this is just a vote to advertise, right? It's not, we're not voting today to say like, oh, it goes up tomorrow. Um, so my, I guess my question is to Mrs. Kane's point, like I think is very important. Is there a way we can kind of guarantee a meeting with the residents before we would vote to actually move forward at, like before the, before the light goes up? Is there a way to guarantee that? So, Mr. Esposito, what, in terms of the process, so if we authorize advertisement um, for bid documents tonight, what's the next step in the process? Well, it's going to go out to bid, and we'll see, uh, you know, the, the bid will actually have to come back to the board to get approved. So it will come back in front of you again, um, and it'll be up to the bid. We'll actually get Mr. Worst's recommendation when the bid comes in, whether it's up to his... Uh, his standards and the township manager's standards. There's certainly time yeah. to do what Ms. Payne is recommending because the documents have to be put together. It has to be advertised multiple times with time delay before it comes back to you. So, I mean, we could certainly pull together a community outreach um, and, you know, sort of make both sides happy. I think that's a reasonable um, path forward. I, I, um, this, this is sort of the classic struggle of local government, which is we're always, we're always doing in our mind important things, and um, we, and this is a perfect example of this project, we've been talking about this publicly for years, multiple supervisors meetings, citizen traffic meeting, public budget workshops. Um, so in our mind as elected officials, this is something that we've been discussing thoroughly and publicly for a very long time. We understand, though, that from the perspective of the public, you're not watching everything that we do. People aren't coming to meetings every two weeks and aren't watching on television and aren't following the agendas. And so it's understandable and reasonable that you wouldn't necessarily know everything that's going on. And, and that's, it's always a challenge. How do you get information out there? Um, it would be literally and logistically impossible for us to contact every resident who might potentially be interested in a particular agenda item every two weeks and let them know, hey, you might want to pay attention because there's something going on that's in the vicinity of where you live. That's, that's not practical. But um, recognizing that, I am always open to suggestions, um, ideas for how we can improve communication with residents, with members of the public, and how we can better involve the public um, in our decision-making process. We are, after all, representatives of you. We're not here on behalf of ourselves. We're here on behalf of you, making decisions for you. And so if we're not listening to you and we're not communicating with you, then we're not doing our job. And so I am um, moving forward in a, in a general way. I am very interested in figuring out ways that we can do this better. But I think for this project, I would be very in favor of um, moving forward tonight with authorizing uh, preparation and advertising of the bid documents, and then during the intervening time period before it comes back to us, making an effort to reach out to the residents specifically in uh, Swan Point and Eagles Mare neighborhoods and anybody else who might be potentially um, close to this location and also specifically trying to schedule maybe one or more 
community meetings where we can have these plans. It doesn't have to be formal. We can just sit around and talk about it. And we can have Phil here, and we can have Chief Bartarelli here, and we can go through this, and we can get some feedback. And maybe in the course of that, we can specifically also include as an agenda item, what are we going to do in Eagles Mayor to try to help you guys? Because you know, you never want the solution to be worse than the problem. And I am, I'm mindful of that, and I, I don't want to do that to you, truly. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, I sympathize for your situation, and the Wawa is a nightmare for you guys. And so you get Wawa plus a new traffic signal, and I understand why you're here and why you're concerned. And so if we can do something to alleviate that and lessen that, we can't control the Wawa, that's not our jurisdiction. Um, but if we can do something for you guys, then, I mean, absolutely, I'm interested and willing to help. So. I would, with that in mind, I would make a motion to authorize preparation and advertisements of bid documents for the Swift Road, Woodburn Road signalization project. Is there a second? I'll second. Can I just make one clarifying question, um, Mr. Esposito? By doing, going out for bid, does that mean the plan that's in place today is going to be the one that's, that's, that goes forward, or is there a, the ability to make it adjustments to that? Well, Ms. Lewis is going to be preparing the bid based off of the plans that were shown today. Yes. Like, that's my only, we can do all the discussion with the residents, but my concern is, is that are they going to feel that, that this is just, you know, they don't have a say in the matter if we do this now before, you know, before giving them a say. Again, I just, I received a lot of feedback and I, I don't want to divide our community. I want to keep it united. and. You know, if another month goes by where we make sure that everyone's aware of it and can really ask the questions that they, they want to ask, I think that goes a long way. If, if I could just add, we can certainly fast track getting the community interaction going on as soon as possible. They're not going to be going out to bid in the next two to three weeks. So maybe we can try to, to get that taken care of so that if there is some minor tweak, that would uh, be acceptable, we could include it. I'll add as well, like our typical bidding process for public bids is like four to six weeks all together, and that's when it's advertised. So not like uh, uh, Major uh, Cools mentioned, it's not going out to bid tomorrow, uh, but when it does, you still have a time period there. And we do have instances where something's bid and there's an addendum posted if there's a small change for the bidders to consider before the bids are actually opened. So with meeting with the residents, if there's anything that's brought back that is something to adjust, even if after it's advertised, you still have an opportunity to just make sure it's exactly the way you want it before the bids are actually opened. So, sorry. Okay. Um, so just to be clear, like it, from what it sounds like, everybody was kind of in favor of doing something for safety reasons, but if we do have time to make an addendum, if we can get a meeting together with everybody, and we get good attendance and people give good feedback to make adjustments before something were to be bidded on. Is that correct? I just want to make sure I'm following properly. Yes, yeah, you have the ability to uh, adjust things if, if you'd like. Um, and also, as mentioned, it comes back after the bids are open for consideration to actually award or not. So there's still the decision at that time as well. Thank you. Yeah, there's been a motion and a second. Are there any board questions? Any questions from the public? Mr. Mallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not a question, but just, just an idea. Um, would it make sense in the interim to throw up and, uh, a couple of stop signs and make it a four-way stop? One, it acts as a proof of concept from a traffic control perspective. Two, it gives out a warning to residents that, hey, change is coming. Three, it immediately begins to, to create some traffic calming, and four, it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. So I would just offer that as a suggestion. Um, I don't know whether that's okay based on ordinance. I'm assuming it is. Um, but again, it would be a great proof of concept. It's low cost, and if nothing else, it makes the residents aware that weren't aware before that changes are coming to this intersection. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mallon. Any other questions or comments for the public? Yeah, Mr. Warren. One, um, good luck um, trying to make everybody happy. I think that's that's excellent on your part. Um, my 
Quite, and I commend the board and all of the residents who, who took part in this. Um, this is what government should be locally. My, my comment, question on the motion, I think the, as you prepare to vote on this on a, on a motion, it might be very helpful if some of the questions that were asked here tonight could be, because I asked them frankly because I don't know the answer. I don't know how many inter how many roads there are in Middletown, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where there are three traffic signals within a half mile of each other. Is this going to be the only such road in? creation or is it it's a very common thing i don't know again um i answer to many of my questions but i think some of them um could be helpful uh to win in the best sense of the word supporters for wherever your vote takes you is this truly a truly unique situation in traffic safety and that ultimately is what my understanding of traffic signals and signage is about, to move traffic as safely, as expediently along the roads with the emphasis on safety. So I'm just wondering about questions like that. How common are three traffic signals within a half mile of each other, for one? Yeah, I, I think um, what we'll try to do is, is when we bring people together for some type of public meeting or presentation, we can try to take into consideration a lot of the questions you posed tonight and hopefully have answers to those questions. Um, I, I would just also like to note that as elected officials, we're not trying to win people over necessarily. We're trying to make the best decisions for the residents of the township. Um, I don't have any horse in this race. I don't live in Swan Point or in Eagles Mare. My only you know, concern is the fact that I'm a resident in this township and I want to make sure that the residents of this township are safe and that traffic is kept as controlled and manageable as it possibly can, given the fact that we are a incredibly busy township from a traffic standpoint. And we are not just busy from the perspective of the people that live here, but the people that travel through here. Um, so, but I just want to make clear that this isn't about one side winning and another side losing. This is, and this isn't about us as elected officials trying to win over residents to get them on board with a project. And in the best sense of the word, I wasn't being cute. I meant by persuasion, win me over. I, I, I wasn't pitting one against, nor disparaging the decision that you all have to make. What I was trying clumsily to say was, Win me over by your eloquent persuasion in the best sense of it. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, I thought um, if you guys could, at the meeting minutes today, could you guys put like a link of the traffic engineering report that we can all see? Because I'm, I'm an engineer by trade, so looking at data that we all can see to educate everybody that's not familiar with this would be really helpful that we all look at the same data. I was trying to find those reports that says number of accidents, number of deaths for the last three years, five years, 10 years, if, if, if that's available, you know, time of dates of. We'll, we'll put all of that together for the public meeting that we're gonna hold. When would? I'm gonna be working on that tomorrow. Okay. Um, and I thought Ms. Payne had an excellent point, just like continue the conversation, because I thought there was really some good ideas thrown around with like the chief saying maybe, you know, put a traffic light, but not have it run all the time. Because I said like, there's a lot, we know there's like two times a day the traffic is bad. No one's gonna deny that. But a lot of times like it's, right, 15 minutes go by. So when I wake up at 6 a.m. and I leave, like there's no one there. But at five o'clock, you know, Maybe we could continue discussion further. So I would love to see the data so we can educate everybody that we're all looking at the same stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? Yes, sir. My name is John Noddett. I'm at 308 Swift Road. I live two, two houses down. Uh, when I came here, 332 was just a two-lane road. 
all right? And as of course, if anything else, more people come in, the traffic gets more and more. We, we, we got the super highway, we have the lights, and now this is. I've been doing, I do risk assessment for uh, chemical companies that handle highly hazardous chemicals. And one of the things people, I think there was a lot of great points, and I try to look at too, is what if? What if we don't put the light in? What if we do put the light in? I don't know how many accidents, I heard different numbers of how many things happen, that traffic light's probably never done to reduce it to zero, right? Because if you just go up to that tenth of a mile, right, on 332 and Woodburn Road, there's a cross there, somebody died. And what's, the, I'd look at probability, and the probability was, what's the probability of me being there and a bad accident happened, and it's happened three times, and there are lights there. So it does happen, and I just want people to be aware of that. It's not gonna reduce it to zero, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge and appreciate you trying to bring everybody in the community together uh, on this issue. Uh, I do want to say to our, our neighbors at Swan Point, I love your community. It's it's an amazing place. Like I, I'm in Eagles Mirror. I, I jog there sometimes. It's great. I want you guys to be safe. I want everybody to be safe. Um, I forgot my point for a second. Oh, I just feel that um, sometimes when we think about these issues, everybody's talking about how dangerous they feel and how awful it is and all this awful traffic. And the more we talk about how awful the traffic is, everything that I'm hearing is, well, okay, it's awful traffic, I understand it. That awful traffic is gonna now gonna funnel its way through our neighborhood. And I don't think that our neighbors across the way want that either. I do want us to come together on this. I want us to be safe. I want us to be all together as one. And I understand their point. I really do. I, I don't want them to be unsafe when coming onto the highway. But I also don't want that lack of safety to actually go into a neighborhood as well, which is kind of, I, I feel it would be different. And with no offense intended, like I said, I, if, if traffic were rerouted through Swan Point, that they would not be in, in it either. It, that would not be a good option, and I would never want that option. I think it's a terrible idea. I don't even know why I bring it to the four point, but except to have it come in an empathetic way that that is what we are thinking about on our side. And I really do want to come together as a community for this, and I appreciate your efforts of having a community conversation about it. So thank you. And, and here's my commitment to you, um, even beyond this, assuming this goes forward. If it happens, once it does happen, Mr. Worcester will specifically look at the impact that it's having on your neighborhood. We'll look at it. And if it's having a detrimental impact on your neighborhood because people are cutting through, then we will absolutely look into what we can do to try to remediate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Donna Salvucci again from 144 Pine Glen. Just thinking about, and I absolutely agree, moving ahead as a cohesive community is very important, and I appreciate the, um, the last gentleman's comments. I, I was just thinking about how to do that, and um, um, your very comprehensive plan, uh, you know, I'm not a visible person, I'm not an engineer. Um, I was wondering if there was a way that we could make that design very visible so that, you know, as we move forward and maybe present that to the larger community, could it be presented and come more like a graphic design way? Like, what would that intersection look lit up with pedestrian walkways, um, with more increased access to 332, so that it, it becomes more visible for maybe the common person like me who's, who doesn't, not used to looking at diagrams? So it might be a little bit more user-friendly. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. How you doing? Mike Cannon, I live at uh, 363 White Swan Way. I'm here with my wife and just picked my daughter up from gymnastics, so I apologize for stepping out for a minute. Um, I would like to say, as far as the community, I think what you said was perfect. Um, I think it's uh, so important for both neighborhoods. We live in one community, right? 
Uh, for the community of White Swan Way, I wanna really thank Donna uh, for Steam, like taking the, the bull by the horn here and, and getting the data. Um, my two young boys were playing at that basin the night of an accident. And I remember them coming home, you know, terrified. They saw a, a horrific accident occur. Those two young men are, one's driving now, the other one I'm currently freaked out driving with him with his permit, um, are gonna be going through that neighborhood and going through that intersection. Um, I can tell you as a driver myself, um, you know, it is, it's terrifying and it, it's scary. I appreciate the board taking the time to listen. I appreciate the people that have brought forth um, the studies um, that, you know, substantiate the data there. It's substantiated with the data. Um, and for the folks that live in the community across from us, this is a community. This is one community, and I appreciate the, the fact that you said, we'll take it to the next step and review it. For now, I think it's so imperative for the safety of our community um, that this does move forward. Um, I'm not only speaking for myself, my community, but selfishly for my two young men who are gonna be driving. Thanks. Thank you. Any other public comment? Last chance, seeing none, there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Passes 3-1. Thank you, Mr. Worcester. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Ms. Tioli Cools. That brings us to other business. Uh, Mr. Kessler. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Esposito. I just want to announce that the board held an executive session prior to tonight's meeting to discuss personnel matters. Thank you. Ms. Tioli Cools. Nothing. Thank you. Ms. Kane. Nothing further. Ms. Corporal. Nothing. Ms. Payne. I just want to say thank you for um, my co to my colleagues and everybody in the township for honoring Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month. As most of you know, that is a cause very near and dear to my heart, and there are actually a few other township residents that also uh, live with cystic fibrosis. I don't want to say suffer because that takes the power away. We are living with cystic fibrosis. Uh, so thank you for that, and I'm, um, I want to applaud the residents that came out tonight to have an open dialogue. It's really important to hear your feedback, and I'm really glad to see that people care about their township and their community, so thank you. Yeah, I would just echo that. I think, Mr. Warren, you hit the nail on the head when you said this is how government is supposed to work. You know, it's people coming together and having an open discussion and finding solutions. So I wish every meeting could, could be this productive. So thank you to everybody who came out and offered um, your opinion, your feedback, and your comments. Uh, with that, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you.